This is 15 Minutes of Freedom. I'm your host, Elite Life Optimization Coach Ryan Nidell, here with a good friend, I'll say co-worker, and past client, all the way from Canada, Taylor Saffington. Taylor, how are you? Good. How are you? I couldn't be better. It sounds so formal starting the podcast that way, and it doesn't really have to because we're like actual friends. It's not like this yeah. formal deal here. <laughs> but I couldn't be more excited to have everyone listening get to digest the incredible knowledge you're going to share with them because you have completely changed the way that I look, feel, think about food, nutrition, health from the inside out. Right, everything happened in my life, I think we would agree, synchronistically, right? It's like the Dave Asprey stuff and some of the bulletproof and the biohacking and then you going from a client to coworker to I'm a client of yours. Like there's all these weird things that came in line to get me to where I'm at. So if you were to sum up what it is that you do for someone, we'll say an elevator pitch, right? You got 10 stories, we're riding on an elevator. Let everybody know what it is that you do for them. Uh, I help you trigger the your body's inner ability to heal. So we all have the capacity to heal from the inside out. We're just not taught how to flip the switch on. Everybody's switches or most of their switches are flipped off based on the exposure of life, the, the assault that we come in contact with on a daily basis. So essentially when I work with someone, I teach you what raw material you need to basically digest, okay, whether it be supplement or food or even lifestyle modification, much like you work with with your clients and meditation and relaxation. And in doing those things, it allows your body to transition to the phase of optimally performing. You're no longer working in a deficit. So it's teaching you how to train your body to show up optimally by providing it the very things that it needs to do so. So wait, just so I'm clear, you're not going to offer me a crash diet? There's not some sort of like, you're not promising me 15 pounds in 15 days or... No, I might go on a small rant about how that's absolutely unsustainable and it doesn't morally align with what I believe to be true for people. So short answer, no, none of that. Everything that we do is sustainable as it should be. So when you say that, what do, what do you believe for people, right? Like I, is, this is a unique interview for me, Taylor, because mm -hmm. we talk so much and I know so much. And yeah. if you've been a longtime listener of me, like if you go back really probably 120 days, you'll start to hear me share different health ideas and tips, admittedly, 80% of those have probably come from a conversation Taylor and I had, right? So I'm, I'm trying to play dumb here and just, yeah. I don't, right? This is a different deal. We all have the, we all have the same working parts, but our parts don't all work the same. I love to say that to clients. So we've got something called bio-individuality. And when I sit across the table or the screen with somebody, whether it be you or someone else, it's about figuring out the story that the body is telling and filling in the small details that are often overlooked. So everything is right and everything is wrong all at the same time. And whether something is right or it is wrong depends on who I'm speaking to and what we're looking to accomplish in terms of their health goals. So I love that. So I, let's tear me apart. Okay. Right. I think I, you know, I started at 268 pounds, 270, whatever. And only be, I, I share weight because it's a quantifiable and quantitative yes. measure, right? We say weight, it, it gives us a benchmark to start from. If you're new to the show, I was an anabolic steroid user for years and years and years, was a 60, 20, 20 diet type of guy, 60% protein, 20% fat, 20% carbohydrates. Didn't really pay much attention to even what they were, right? Like a carb was a carb to me. Like I'm eating brown rice and then it was jasmine rice. Then it was potatoes. Like it was just like, just a free fall for all. I need to eat 7,000 calories a day. I'm stuffing my mouth full. Then I end up getting an abscess as I don't care about anabolics anymore. Take a month and a half of like the most aggressive antibiotics I possibly could in an effort to keep me out of the ER, right? I mean, I was septic, right? I was, yeah. I was really, really not in a good spot. And then we met and I was 270. And what did you see in me that were the things, it's a little tough for you to go back there, right? But like, I got to assume that as you're listening, you've heard me talk for long enough. You might've seen me on social media. You have some idea of who I used to be versus who I am now. So I want to help you understand what Taylor's process is. Inflammation. I mean, it's the first place that I can go with most people. A lot of people present them. It's like that puffy, 
um, sometimes I appear fat, but you are not fat. You know, a lot of people interpret inflammation as fat, soft, holding water. So I saw a lot of inflammation with you. Overall, you had really healthy habits. I mean, unfortunately, most of the people I come in contact with aren't taught what, what they need to instill in terms of foundational habits to build a framework or a structure for a healthy life. And we've got social media the news, social outlets, et cetera, that are constantly pounding us with the, you need to do this and the need to know information, most of which is based on pseudoscience. So if I were to go back and say what I saw on you first, it was inflammation. And then there's a curiosity with you too, which I think is what made it so easy to work with you eventually, where I know there were plenty of times on our you know calls together where it was you and I working client to mentor. And I was like, trying to slip things in, you know, like, well, maybe we should try this. And what are your thoughts on this? But, you know, inflammatory based responses, the septic thing is probably something that contributed to it. Cause what most people don't realize is our liver is the mother organ of detoxification and its job, its primary job is to keep us from going septic. So the fact that you were septic is a sure sign to me that there was a toxic buildup in the blood that your, your liver was not able to keep up with. So what does our body do when it can't keep up with our toxic load? It shuttles, the blood shuttles those toxins into adipose tissue or fat cells, of which on the back end, it's like shutting the door, locking it, and throwing away the key. From a blood-based perspective, our body has kept us safe. From a body-based perspective, those cells then swell, the adipose tissues swell, and they produce aromatase, which is estrogenic in nature, all of which physically appears as inflammation on the outside. But you had a lot of good habits, like you were doing the celery juice, again, everything's right and everything's wrong all at the same time. We came to find that that's not something that worked well with you. You know, that craze is not going to work well with everyone. It's all about bio-individuality. And you were very receptive to changing things eventually, trying to add something in and take something out. But overall, without seeing blood work, without looking at lab testing for you, it was inflammatory-based responses. And you can see it predominantly in the face. And the changes that you've made, like how you're appearing now. So I would stick with inflammation as to what I saw with a lot of receptivity to change. Okay. I'll take that. I thought it was going to be much more brutal than that. So that, that feels good. No. Inflammation. Yeah. And so obviously we look at ourselves in the mirror. Like I was looking, I'm like, man, I'm holding more fat, you know, below my belly button than I'm used to. And I'm holding more fat on my love handles, my lower back. Like, why won't this go away? I'm, I'm boxing an hour a day. I'm in the gym training an hour a day. After that, I'm eating incredibly, fairly healthy and clean, right? There's different levels of what that could mean. Mm-hmm. And it's like the fat just wasn't going away. Now, from my current standpoint, I realized it wasn't necessarily all adipose tissue, right? It wasn't necessarily fat. There was some inflammation and things like that. But it's interesting to hear you say over and over again that it's, I had healthy lifestyle habits. Yeah. Because as I look now, I wouldn't say I actually did. Mm -hmm. From that level of perception of reality that I had at that moment, I was very healthy. Like I'm infrared sauna and smoothies. Wow. And, but then we tore some things apart and it's like, yeah, I'm really messing this all up for myself. This is a journey though. Like it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And the cool thing is, is our body's dynamic and our habits have to be equally as dynamic. So we have to recognize when things do and do not work for us. And that's constantly going to change at a foundational level. I think everybody can agree. You and I have talked about this when it comes to food consumption, more fruits, more vegetables, less inflammation on the front end of it. We've got this obsession with protein too, which we can talk about. You know, everybody's got this obsession with excessively consuming protein, which I don't quite understand because if you understand the physiological detriment to the body, most people would gear that intake back. And I think you've come to find that there's benefit on the back end of basically skimming that down, like your regular intake of protein, just skimming it down, you know, but when it comes to food consumption, most people are overfed and undernourished. I'm sure many of your listeners have heard that where we've got weakened digestion. We're not chewing our food appropriately. Like you and I have gone back and forth about this where it's like, you've got to put your fork down. You've got to chew 10 to 30 times. It's going to be like 
you got, it starts in the mouth. You know, then we don't have the adequate amounts of hydrochloric acid in the stomach. Our enzymatic capacity from the pancreas is diminished. So there's all these things that are going into play in terms of our digestion, you know, and then you add something as thermogenic. It is very thermogenic, but as arduous and laborious in as how many grams of protein were you consuming? Like 160. Oh, no, I was trying to get, in my bodybuilding days, it was certainly a, a two pounds of protein for, or two grams of protein for every pound of lean muscle. So I would have okay. in between 475 and 550 a day, 475 to 550. Oh my God, your poor liver, your poor kidneys and your poor belly. So like when you put that into the framework, you go, oh my God, no wonder. It takes us anywhere from six to 14 hours to fully digest animal-based protein just because our, the pH in our stomach is two to three, not one to two. And then we've got 28 feet of digestive tract as opposed to six, like our carnivorous, like our carnivore cousins, like the lion. So it's like, it's very laborious. It's very labor intensive. And most people don't tie it together that we're just taking amino acids from the protein and pulling them in the liver. Our body actually assembles protein as it sees fit and as we need it. So it's not like we eat the protein and it deposits into the muscle. Anything that's not used in the body is going to be turned into adipose tissue. So overall, I would like looking at your habits, you, I think you had really good habits, but you have to understand a lot of the people that I come into contact with, standard American diet, underhydrated not going to the bathroom regularly, have no idea what celery juice is, which is fine. I'm okay with it. Over-consuming protein, overly um, focused on macros. So when it comes to your habits, you were drinking water regularly, you were going to the bathroom daily, you had a pretty good idea of what you needed in terms of food intake. We just had to shift that around. It's simple shifts, you know? And then on the back of it, we had to look at your medical history. That's always important too, to determine what a person needs and how they're showing up in their day and how they can optimally show up in their future. You know, today versus tomorrow, moving forward and present. Well, of course, I love the fact of talking about digestion and we'll say restroom usage, right? I'll say yeah. well, my excrement, right? Bowel yeah. I want to talk about it. We're consistently inconsistent. Yes. I, I had no problem using the restroom multiple times a day in a very, if I say explosive, it might be too. But it's true. But it's, pretty, it's pretty darn true, right? There, there were, it was just a, it was a mess consistent, but I'm like, man, I know if I'm, if I'm looking behind myself as I complete that mission and it doesn't look a certain way, there's no way I'm digesting and absorbing nutrients. Like it's illogically, like, I'm not brilliant, but like, I can't go to the bathroom six times a day and have mm -hmm. water and lettuce type stuff sitting in the toilet and say like, what is going on? Like I had yeah. fucking steak for dinner last night and this is coming out. Like there's, there's something happened in the middle. Yeah. So transition time, what transition time is 12 to 24 hours. So if you have two to three meals the day before, you should be having one to three bowel movements the next day. I would prefer to see two to three just because transition time, there's a lot that goes into it, but that's a healthy transition time for the bowels. Constipation means you're not digesting your food. Diarrhea means you're not absorbing any of the nutrients. So you're bang on with that. And soft, solid consistency is what we're looking for. Like everybody laughs at me when I talk to them, you need to ghost wipe. Like there's no other way to put it. We're going to go there. Ghost wiping is the way to go. It's, it's a real thing. And then oftentimes I ask my clients, does your shit stink? Like there's no, like, your shit should not stink. I hate to say it, but when you start to make transitions in how you're consuming food-based products, whole foods, plant-based foods, with your animal protein in smaller you know, portions, you'll start to notice a change in your stool as well, your ba bathroom habits as well. They'll become soft solid. They'll become consistent. There will be ghost swiping and there will be no stench. That's important. Stench is an indication that there's some sort of um, imbalance in the bowels. Let's just put it that way. So. Huh. Okay. Like there's so many things that I want you as you're listening to take away. The first one is certainly that was huge for me. I love that Taylor said 10 to 30 chews, right? And you're chewing your food 10 to 30 times. <laughs> I'm going to challenge you to say it's just 30, right? If we give ourselves that window of 10 to 30, we all inherently err towards the easiest, not the hardest. Mm-hmm. So when you take a bite of food, take it a little smaller than you used to, put it in your mouth, put the fork down and sit there. Don't talk. Don't rush. Be present. Be mindful. Chew your food over and over and over again and physically count to 30. 
just do that in your next meal and see how long it feels like it takes you to chew, chew your food. Like it's like, I was literally Taylor when I started, it was probably, if I was lucky, yeah, if I was lucky, I was chewing five times before I was. Yeah. Well, that's the thing too, like with breath work, which I know you, you work with breath work with your clients, but when we are constantly shallow breathing, we are putting ourselves into the sympathetic nervous system state. We are in fight or flight. We're running from a bear. And the last thing our body wants to do is to digest anything. We shunt blood flow from the bowels to the extremities when we're in fight or flight, you know? So when, when you eat, chewing forces you to do that breath work in a mindful manner while transitioning you to the rest and digest phase so that you can adequately digest your food. You're not going to do that when you're stressed. Well, let's, talk about, well, uh, let's talk about digestion as far as it goes into the evening rituals, right? Like if, so often as a bodybuilder, it was an alarm clock on my phone, everything, yeah. no matter what was going on, I was getting up to eat. Like it was just like clockwork. And yeah you expose me to something much different as far as consumption of final meal versus bedtime versus consumption of first meal in the morning and integrating coffee or not coffee, right? Like the whole ideology behind that as well. So when it comes to meals prior to bed or any meals in general, I recommend spacing your meals out four hours for blood sugar regulation purposes. So three and a half to four hours, I say four just to be safe because it takes our body a good three and a half hours to respond in terms of blood sugar regulation. A lot of people get this like hangry, this irritability, this dizziness in between meals at the two and a half hour mark. And it's simply due to it could be adrenal fatigue, but adrenal fatigue plays into blood sugar dysregulation. And when we're eating every two and a half to three hours, we are then putting undigested food on top of partially digested food, and we're creating a mess in our belly. There's no other way to put it. Talk about fermentation, talk about gas flow, talk about diarrhea, constipation, irregular bathroom habits. It all stems from two and a half to three hours, irregularity in bowel movements, not chewing our food. And when it comes to bedtime, we really need to stop eating two to three hours prior to getting into bed because our body goes into heavy lifting mode overnight. It's when we do restoration. It's when we finish detoxification. It's when we do compartmentalization and immune system repair. The last thing we want is for our body to be concerned with finishing digesting a labor intensive meal because we chose to eat an hour and a half before bedtime. It just doesn't work. You know, this allows our body to show up in the way with which our body's natural circadian rhythm is meant to work because our organs have a circadian rhythm too. You know, it's not just us following sun up to sun down. It's our organs switching function on and off too. Like cortisol goes down around 9 p.m. Like we get a really shift sharp drop at 9 p.m. and melatonin starts to take its way up. As soon as we do anything that shifts us out of that relaxed state, cortisol is going to take precedence and melatonin is going to suppress. Most people can't get a good night's sleep because your melatonin is tanked. And the more sleep that you get prior to the hour of midnight, the deeper recovery your body is able to go into. So, and this is all based in Ayurvedic tendencies. This is all based in Ayurvedic traditional medicine, which has been around for 6,000 plus years. So everybody wants the data. We've got plenty of it. It's there, you know? Well, I love that because society as a whole, in my opinion, we're all looking for, I hate to use a broad statement, but I do believe we're all looking for the quick fix. So like instantly I hear, well, melatonin deficiency. I'll just go out and buy melatonin and I'll take the melatonin before I go to bed and that just solves everything. And while that might be a band-aid for the issue, right? Like your body is supposed to produce a melatonin that wouldn't require you to go out and buy, although melatonin is not expensive, it wouldn't require you to go buy melatonin. Like right. you just naturally produce it. And as you get tired, go to sleep. Like that's that. I call it the false lift, right? So yeah. that, that fear of missing out the thing of like, Oh, I got to watch this TV show. or I got to stay up later. There's something else going on. That nine, nine thirty, nine forty five 945 is as the sun goes down, as all those things happen in your time zone, it switches something in your body, a mm-hmm. rhythm of, okay, it's time to shut it down for the night. And then we fight through that. And then all of a sudden you're like, no, I'm so energized before I go to bed. Bullshit. You were tired at nine, nine thirty. We all are like, yeah. but we fight through it. And then our body switches back into fight or flight, right? Essentially. 
Yeah. Now we're lifted and ready to run again. And it's like, well, now I can't go to bed at 12, 12, 30 or one. I just toss and turn because you've shut off the natural circadian rhythm. Your body's trying to self-regulate. And then you're hitting snooze 10 times the next morning because you can't get yourself up because your cortisol curve is complete. It's shifted. There's no other way to put it. It's shifted. One bad night of sleep can mess us up for up to two weeks. Like one bad night of sleep has massive impact. It's got massive detriment on the body. Like it's, there's, It's so crazy, isn't it? Yeah. And blue blocking glasses. That's another thing that obviously I was doing prior to meeting you. And then you turned me on to True Dark and True Dark just up leveled my game. So I would encourage everyone listening to go out and get themselves a pair of True Dark. I love the brand blue blocking glasses for the day. And then the amber ones at night are incredible. Um, they just, they switch everything off immediately. You think you're tired by nine for pushing like eight thirty in my house. Cause the glasses just remove any sort of stimuli that you're going to get from a device, much like your phone where so many people spend the last minutes of their day. That's the other thing too. People just don't connect enough anymore. So like if you look at the blue zones, if you look at um, these areas in life where there are centenarian populations, so people that are living far beyond the age of 90, nobody's spending the last half hour of their day on their iPhone checking Instagram. It's just not, it's not the ticket to health and longevity. If anything, it's quite the opposite. But here in the U.S., I've noticed that, you know, or in Canada, I've noticed that we lack this interpersonal connection that's so incredibly important to our own health and our own longevity. Because health is not just about the food that we eat, the supplements that we take. It's also about what we consume and how we connect with people, you know, our community and environment around us. It's huge. Absolutely. So Taylor, you, you also touched base throughout this little segment so far on some different principles and things you've learned along the way, which I think are equal mm -hmm. or if not even more important because you had, I mean, you were in quote unquote traditional or normal medicine. Like yes. You yeah. were in your hospital world setting of understanding what quote unquote we're supposed to do. Right. And I, I don't, it's, it's yeah. backwards. Right. But like you start hearing naturopath and right. Ayurvedic and it's like, people are like, it, admittedly when you first told to me, I'm like, yeah, okay, that's great. And like it, yeah. I'm a really open guy and it just was like, yeah, cool, whatever, like brush out the side. Yeah. And you started diving into your history, which I think is, I would love if you, if you don't mind sharing that. So in regards to how I got into this space as an integrative health practitioner? Floor is yours, my friend, whether it, you, you have your own story to tell and this is the platform okay. to get it out, whatever that means to you. Okay. So I went to school to be a registered dietitian. I finished that program I went through I went through all of the motions and found myself in a clinical setting it was not for me you know the the TPN formulas God bless the dietitians of the world because they are the low man on the totem pole there is no other way to put it we are not looked at as a necessity we are looked at as an optional add-on much like an a la carte service um, I that did not agree with me you know like that did not morally align with me so I practiced for a very short period of time, after which rather quickly I came to the conclusion that this is not my place in life. This is not where I was supposed to be. So I maintained um, positions within the healthcare field because I always wanted to stay in touch primarily with patient care. I love working with people. But on the back end of that, I wanted to stay up to date on insurance. I wanted to stay up to date on the latest technologies. I wanted to know what was happening on different floors of the hospital. I wanted to be basically keep a pulse on all of that because eventually what I would come to find is in working in all of these capacities, it showed me the gaps that were there and where we could actually fill it in. And it's very simplistic in nature. Uh, essentially, somebody goes into the hospital with a chronic condition, let's say cardiovascular disease. Chronic conditions are self-inflicted 90% of the time. I'd say 95% of the time they're self-inflicted. What do I mean by that? Lifestyle, habit, everybody plays this. Oh, well, you know, my mom has it, my dad has it. My friend, genes are 10% of the equation. Lifestyle and environment is 90%. So when you look at it, it's really, is your lifestyle and your environment perpetually causing your body to flip that switch on. You could say the same about cancer too. You know, it's all about lifestyle and environment. So what I came to find in working in acute rehab, I did rehabilitative care and then I did hospice, which I loved hospice. I loved end of life care. Um, that brings a whole new perspective on death, dying and mortality. When you're able to bear witness to somebody crossing over 
and then observing the family on the back end of it. Um, and then I spent my last three years in cardiovascular care. So obviously people who had had myocardial infarctions, who had had triple bypass surgery, you know, and the picture was very clear to me at that point where I was like, okay, like I cannot stand here and be part of the perpetual circle of just people being sent home with pills and devices. Thank God for them, you know, because most people are not set up foundationally to leave the hospital and, and do well. We fall back into our old habits. Like you've always taught, you know, what does it take six months to really ingrain yourself into a new lifestyle? Most people leaving the hospital are not interested in ingraining themselves into a new lifestyle. They just want to get home, feel better and get on with their life. So it was at that point, life co-conspired. I met my husband, I quit my job, I moved to a new country, and Tailored Wellbeing was born. Personally, I competed too. I competed for three years. So at the ripe age of 17, which reflectively, I should have never been competing that young. I just, my body was not prepared for it. I was approached by a woman who did fitness and figure competition. She was a personal trainer. She was like, God, you're so cute. You do so well in fitness. Well, I heard cute and fitness and I was like, I'm in, let's try it. I've never done anything like this before. So that set me on a three year journey of training and competing. I had never done a back, like I had never done a cartwheel in my life. I got into gymnastics training. I got a choreographer. It was all very interesting, very bedazzled and wholly detrimental all at the same time because I was put in contact with a nutritionist a nutritionist who basically put my measurements into a computer and spit out a diet that I was supposed to be following. Re you know, reflectively, that diet wrecked me. You know, as most competitors come to find on the back end of competing, your body is, um, there's no other way to put it, your body's fucked. Like, you know, upside down, inside out, you're trying to find your way back to a new norm. So on the back end of three consecutive years of competing, I did really well. I was the youngest competitor in the Monica Brandt Fitness Classic. We'll just take it way back to Monica Brandt because that's when I competed. Yeah. You know, I had irritable bowel syndrome. I had a colonoscopy. I had hypothyroidism. Like I went from this tiny little competitor in this little bathing suit that fit into a Ziploc bag. We all know what that's like to blowing up. Like I didn't recognize myself when I looked at myself in the mirror. And I committed to myself. I finally found myself a naturopath after a year and a half of constantly being an experiment. There's no other way to put it. I found myself a naturopath who began walking me down the path of getting a bit better. What we came to find on the back end of it was I had a candida overgrowth. I had bacterial imbalance. My thyroid, my adrenals were shot. This was all new to me. I had no idea what she was talking about. This is where the real education began. You know, so my adrenals were shot and my thyroid was suffering because of it. And it was in working with her that I was able to de develop new habits and implement those new habits, graduate off of, you know, thyroid medication, find my way back to a new normal weight, and basically redefine my relationship with my body, which the hilarious part of this entire story was I then got breast implants. Like, let's just add insult to injury. I'm on this path of going back to my roots essentially. And then I'm like, Oh, my breast tissue, like my boobs are completely uneven. I've got no breast tissue left. Let's go get silicone implants, which was another whole nother path to go down. No, I'm, I'm glad you went down that. Cause I was going to bring it up. At what age did you decide to go down that route? 21. I was so young. I was 21 and everyone in my life was very supportive. I was very self-conscious in everything that I wore. So like I didn't fit in bathing suit tops. I didn't fit in tank tops. I didn't fit in dresses that I wanted to fit in, like fit on the bottom, didn't fit on the top. So a lot of it was driven by what I would say, my 32 year old self would say was a lot of lack of self-love mm -hmm. and um, a bit of naivety. You know what I mean? Not knowing what I was getting myself into. So I got silicone implants at the age of 21, size B. I didn't go super large. I just wanted something that looked natural. You know, two and a half years later, and not only did I go through a rather intense breakup, which I believe the emotional component of that triggered something in my body, but I was diagnosed with Epstein-Barr virus. My titers were so high, they were sent to the state health department. For anyone who doesn't know what that is, it's, um, it's a form of mono. It's a chronic form of mono that 
we all carry, 95% of us carry, and some sort of triggering event is usually what flips that switch on. So I was diagnosed with mono, and then I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia, then I was diagnosed with chronic fatigue, then I was diagnosed with celiac, and it was like, I was 23, and I was going, what the hell? Like, I'm not supposed to be this sick at 23. So again, when the student shows up, the teacher shows up. Life pointed me in the direction of alternative healthcare providers, of which, you know, conventional medicine just, it was like this repetitive circle. Every time I saw my doctor, it was, well, you need to eat healthy and you need to exercise. I'm a dietitian. I work in the healthcare field. I'm very active. None of your advice is working for me. And the antivirals that you want to prescribe me are not indicated in treating the condition that you say that I have. It's because conventional medicine is not taught about autoimmune conditions and they're not taught to look at the body in a way with which the gut is perpetuating the disease. So acupuncture, another set of naturopaths, functional medicine doctors, it just led me down this whole rabbit hole of discovery, further discovery. So there was a point, I mean, I, I don't know how to bring this in, but there's, there's yeah. a point where you had them removed. Yes. So eight years, it was at my eight year checkup. I was, what is it? 2019. So 2016, I had them removed. I went in for an appointment because I had done everything and I still had vague symptoms at all times. And I started researching and I'm like, okay, well, the only thing that's possibly like that's left is my, my implants. And all signs were starting to point to, yes, this could be part of the problem. So I went in, I made a, an appointment with the plastic surgeon. I went in. It took a little bit of time with him to finally admit. Like he fished with me and I fished with him for a long time because I was just in there to get my implants removed. But he was so baffled by the fact that my boobs that look so good, his words, that I wanted them out. Like, you don't want to just replace them? No, no, I don't want to just replace them. Finally, he was like, okay, what's up? Well, I have X, Y, Z, P, D, Q, you know, and he's the, the expression on his face. I will never forget. It was essentially, okay, well, what we don't often discuss is that there has been clinical data to show that having these, all of this is worded very carefully, right? Having these can indeed elicit autoimmune conditions in the body. It's a foreign object in the body. There's no other way to put it. And if you're already dealing with an, um, like an auto or immune system that's in a deficit because you've dealt with all of these conditions leading up to this point, it's, an, it's on high alert. So my body essentially spent eight years trying to get an, a foreign object out of it that wasn't supposed to be in it. And I felt the repercussions of that physically. So it was not pretty too. I can say the girls have settled in nicely. Like a few yeah. years later, the girls have settled in nicely. The family's all back together. But um, it was a very interesting, I was in a good place psychologically to do it too. I think had I not been in a good place psychologically, seeing what you look like after you've had the implants, post implant or, you know, post explant, it's a little jarring. I've shared my pictures on social media. You look like flat balloons. There's no other way to put it. Like the air is just completely you know, let out of them. It takes a little bit of time for everything to settle back in. It's a trauma. So, well, yeah. And speaking of trauma. Like yes. You, oh gosh, how do I segue into this one? <laughs> you had in your 20s a, right, your, your 20s were a tumultuous time. We, we spoke about, you know, different things in the body and things like that, but you touched base on that relationship that was a little uh, trying. Right. Yeah. It taught you a lot. However, we want to put the positive spin on it, and I don't want yeah. to, you know, d d beat up on someone's not here to defend themselves. But obviously, right. I think that's as equally important part of who you are and what goes into who you show up as as a coach. Yeah. Anything else? Any of the degrees? Right. We're on a Zoom call. There's degrees. Yes. There's, there's training, but it's like this little window of time that you dealt with the things that I would love for you to share. Yeah are equally as impactful. So much like I said, I was lacking in self-love and self-confidence when it came to the implants. I was lacking in self-love and self-confidence when it came to choosing partners. And that continued far beyond the engagement that was broken up. So we had dated, I will leave him nameless, but we had dated a year. We got engaged and it was like one of those fast, hot, furious, like we were a good couple or so I thought. But I knew very little about drug addiction, and he was a recovering addict. 
So when I met him, he was completely sober. And I just thought that was the greatest thing ever at, you know, the ripe old age of 22. I was like, oh God, he's never going to fall off the wagon again. I didn't know enough about it. And in being with him, I immersed myself in the um, NA community. Like I oftentimes went to meetings with him and was there to bear witness to all of the chips that he was picking up. Um, but it became starkly apparent to me while we were living together. I graduated, got my first job. I was the one supporting the household. You know, all of the red flags and writing on the wall was very apparent to probably the people that loved and surrounded me, but not so apparent to myself. And it wasn't until I discovered that he was doing drugs again that things just blew up in my face. Because I was always taught as soon as the addict falls off the wagon, and I don't know if I agree with this today or if I would have handled it differently, but as soon as the addict falls off the wagon, you go. Like it's a form of tough love. And that's exactly what I did. But I didn't have the mental capacity at my age, at 23, you know, to really handle what was in front of me. It was messy. You know, there was no, not, there was nothing clean about it. There was a lot of back and forth. We were together. We weren't together. He was with 10 other people. I was depressed. It was just, it was very, I, like, I, I was single for two and a half years after the fact. What does that tell you? It devastated me, you know, but reflectively, I needed that just like I needed it to catapult my growth. I needed it to push me onto the next level of person that I was supposed to become. And it did without a doubt. It, it challenged me in ways that I had never been challenged before. So. And you also got that incredible little two legged gift out of that equation as well. Uh, he came later. He came later. Okay. So, so there was the engagement at 23. Then there was a two year stint. There was, there was another relationship with a lovely gentleman who showed me no attention, like none whatsoever. Everyone else in life, you know, and his priorities were, and goals were more important than I was. I accepted that for a very long time. Um, and then I decided to move on. And in a rebound situation, I got a beautiful two-legged blonde little boy, um, which was equally as violent. I mean, the relationship was short, fast, domestically abusive and violent. Um, more so verbally and mentally as well as emotionally. Um, I always say that that was the metaphorical turning point for me where I put my foot down to the universe and I said, no more of this bullshit. I will never be with somebody who treats me like a doormat ever again. You know, because the reality of it is the details of that relationship and what I went through on the back end were not anything someone should ever have to go through. I, was, I became a single mom because of it, you know. Another really tough, beautiful life lesson to learn. Well, you, you've, you've found love and peace and yes. a family unit, and <laughs> you're moving from Canada back to home base, if you will. Yes. Right? Where you, you denounced, well, I may not denounce your citizenship, right? But you went from U.S. citizen to working on either whatever. Like you're coming yes. back to the States. You're I'm coming, coming home. It's a homecoming. Yes. You know, Canada's beautiful, but it's not home to me. I have to, like, if I'm being completely honest, which is something that you taught me to do, you have to own, you just have to own the things that you want in life, whether they rattle the boat or they don't rattle the boat, you know, and this is kind of rattling the boat, but in the best way possible. I mean, I'm coming home. I want to come home. I don't want to be here. Not that it's not beautiful. It's just not home. And it took me very little time to come to that conclusion insert working with you too. You helped me get, probably get to it a lot quicker than I would have. Well, I, I appreciate the accolades, right? Like I'm going back to our time together and I don't have your, your notebook, right? I keep a, an individual notebook for every client. And I think at this point I probably shredded or destroyed yours because it's not appropriate to keep it around. But if I remember met you, your, your husband is just about to be I'll call it deployed, right? He's, he's got to go away and, and <laughs> military things. That's how that works. Yeah. You have a business that you are crushing it in the way that you show up with clients. Like yeah. phenomenally big. But your internal value proposition of what your self-worth was only as it pertains to the monetary reciprocation from a client was not yeah. where I thought it should be. Yeah. Right. And then like it's the doubt and the stuff and I don't know how to do this and no one's gonna pay this and XYZ. And I'm like, you know, it's like you're you're brilliant. Like it, it's okay. And then like I gotta stay in Canada and I don't like it here and I'm alone and all the like it's all, so these, true. <laughs> all these things. And they were all true, right? None of these I'm a big believer in your truth is one hundred percent right. Like it's not I'm not judging it. It's just like, look, you you're worth 
a lot of money, certainly more than, I mean, I'll make up a number, 30 bucks a month, right? Like yeah. <laughs> for, yeah. for access to you is certainly worth more than that. And there's just been this incredible rebirth of mm -hmm. not only you as a woman, but you as a coach. And then that rebirth has spun all the way into you really running life optimization health, which ends up being the health side, the health specific side of, I'll say my company, our company, the company, I don't care yeah. how that works. It's like I, our friendship and our bond and our relationship has grown in such a capacity that, and you've shown up so much like your authentic self. I won't even say differently. You're just being who you're supposed to be. Yeah. And all of a sudden it's like, cool. Like all the clients that work with me one-on-one -on -one get access to Taylor. And yeah, it's this incredible path that we take someone don't care where you're at. Like you, I think there's another thing, at least inside of our worlds, you don't have to be flawed or broken. Your body doesn't have to feel like shit. Like mine at 270, I felt good. Like in my mind, don't have any problem getting up. Don't have any problem falling asleep. Right? Yeah. A couple aches and pains. I don't necessarily love the way I look in the mirror, but to the outside world, it's like, you're yeah. or whatever the terms are, right? Big shoulders, yeah. chest, whatever those things are. And then it's just, you know, hitting these check boxes to, to change. So I actually felt good from the inside out. Mm -hmm. you know, we would help, you would help someone do and plus scaling businesses and getting clear on what's important to you and being able to own that. And like, it's, it's just such a cool thing to see from my seat because our story was so random. Really. It really was. So I was on um, Jordan and Aaron's podcast, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what's the name of their podcast? I, don't, I feel like Flow it's, State of Mind. Yeah, Flow State of Mind podcast. Mm -hmm. You should absolutely go listen to it. Not my episode, just the podcast in general. <clears throat> they had helped Taylor out with some business things prior to me ever meeting Taylor. Mm -hmm. I think you either were, I think there was something going on and I was looking for help. You had high blood pressure. Jordan was like, oh, talk to Taylor. Thank you, Jordan. Um, and then things just catapulted from there because the more that I consumed your content, the more I was like, he speaks my language. I need to work with him somehow, some way, but like he speaks my language. He, he does float pods and he does plant-based medicine and he's into meditative and spiritual practices, all of which like those things light me up like a Christmas tree. I love them. I'm fascinated by them. I've delved into them pretty much my entire adult life. Like it just worked. There's no other way to put it. Like I felt compelled to reach out to you. So I did. And then we ensued in a coaching relationship, which has been life changing. So, and I love that. I'm honored by that. Like I still remember I'm at Ryan Daniel Moran's mastermind. He also has a podcast. I completely, I don't want to say I forget that we had an appointment, but I'm like, we're messaging back and forth on that Instagram. I'm like, yeah, sure. Give me a call. Having no <laughs> idea what you wanted, right? Like there was no, yeah. <laughs> there was no sale. There was no anything. Yeah. It's like, yeah, sure. Let's just catch up. And then all of a sudden you're like, yeah, I'd like to work with you. And I'm like, wait, excuse me? Yeah. Okay, I, I want to work <laughs> I with just, you. I just put it out there. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's been so cool to see you change and then have you help change me. Right. Cause as I yeah. sit in this chair, I'm gosh, 252, 253 pounds, something like that. Right. Feel yeah. better than I felt in my entire adult life. Right. Almost no aches and pains. Have yep. no problem saying it. I still want a little more muscle. Right. I want to put yeah. back on just a little bit. We're trying to dial in some of those variables but I'm consistent. I mean, shoot, between you and Bryce Prescott, you introduced me to coffee enemas, right? Yeah. The whole deal. I did one this morning, right? Before, They're fantastic. During my They're core fantastic. four. Yes. And they make you feel incredible. And there's, it's like we said at the beginning, when the student's ready, the teacher appears, you know, and after you and I had enough conversation, I think the receptivity opened just a little bit more like, okay, I can try something. It's once somebody fully commits to the idea of trying something that they get to see how it works from the inside out. And now I think you've gotten to see what that process looks like from the inside out and you go, oh, okay, it all makes sense now. Most of the time, this isn't going to make sense until you go all in. It didn't make sense to me until I went all in. It doesn't make sense to any of my clients until we go all in. And then they go, I'm so glad I did this. You know, cause I understand with natural medicine too, you and I've had this conversation where People oftentimes go to well-intended practitioners and end up with 55 supplements with no end in sight and no real plan walking out the door. And it's all very well-intended, but a really good protocol 
requires time specific goals and like protocols strategy much like you teach with your coaching it's all about strategy and there's a lot that you can accomplish in 16 weeks that doesn't require 55 supplements and no end in sight as you're coming to see and a lot of it's like a staircase you start in one place and then you take a step up to the next level dependent upon what your body needs and it's always going to provide the details it's just our job to listen to the story and fill in the pieces so yeah, and I love that. I mean, if you're curious what that looks like, so, so far I've been on what we'll call three individual seven-day detox that run mm-hmm. consecutively. Yep. Very well mapped out. It's very specific to heal myself essentially from the inside out, get some of that liver, kidney function, getting more clean, getting rid of the stuff that's been in me for a long time, just really setting a base level. Yep. I happen to be hopping on a plane in two days to go to Costa Rica right, for a yeah. little plant-based medicine for seven days. But then coming back, I now have another 21-day protocol. 90. 90. 90. It's three months. Yeah. Awesome. Yes. <laughs> What's crazy, this isn't even, like, I'm not saying that with any sort of disdain in my voice. After this protocol, I have chosen to stay on the exact same way of eating and living just without some of the supplemental support in the same order because I can get a little more nutrient density but not more necessarily, but I can backfill the nutrient density for this week instead of ordering different yeah. pieces of parts. And I feel incredible. Like mm-hmm. I'm good. Yeah. And that's the point. And most people don't realize how good they're supposed to feel and how well their body, their body's supposed to function and the mechanics of it. And so they're like, oh, I think I've been doing it wrong this whole time because I didn't know any better. So and side note as it pertains to that. I'm still eating 43 to 4,600 calories a day, right? I'm not starving. I'm not hungry. Yes. I'm irritable. I'm not, you know, it's not chicken and rice in a plastic container in a cold bag over in the corner of the office, right? Like it's good, healthy foods in sequential order that are dialed into my specific needs that allow me a big plethora of choices. Yeah. And they're all combined appropriately. You talk about chicken and rice. Chicken and rice is probably one of the worst combinations in the world digestively. So all of your foods are finally being paired in a way that your body can synergistically break them down and utilize the nutrients. So it's important. It is incredibly important. And in X, uh, in a way to tie it together as we talk about importance, Taylor, if someone wanted to follow you on social media, if they wanted to get a hold of you via email, yeah. how they just connect with people on how they get a hold of you. So I am very active on Instagram. You can find me at Tailored Wellbeing. My email is also attached to that profile. Um, if you wanted to, you know, talk to me outside of social media and or email, there's a link tree to get in touch with me with a Calendly. I am on Facebook at the same handle at Tailored Wellbeing. So pretty uniform across the board. Yeah. And we're trying to figure out and trying, I don't even like that word. We're in the process of figuring out how to brand life optimization health and what that means as far as Taylor's side. And I don't want her to shut down her brand, but same thing. If for some reason you can't get a hold of her or you don't understand how to spell well-being, email Ryan at life optimization group, you'll get forwarded right to her. If this segment, this tailored well-being segment of this show (laughs) is going to be a little mini series for us, we're going to do these at least for the next six or there'll be six or eight more episodes in total just so we can dive more into this because I think it's such an integral part of not only what my coaching is, but also how to make people's lives better. And Taylor happens to be launching her own podcast. Don't know where she got that from. Don't know why she (laughs) came up with that, but nonetheless, she's doing it. And Taylor, what will that podcast be called? Well, we are working on the name right now. It's WTF. So the wellness transformation, transformation freedom podcast. It's what I'd like to keep it. But we shall see moving forward. We will figure out a way to keep that. It'll be the Wellness Transformation Freedom Podcast. And it's just giving people tidbits. It's much like 15 Minutes to Freedom, 15 to 20 minute long podcast, giving you tangible things that you can utilize and actionable steps to watch wellness happen in your life. It's just that easy. Taylor, I thank you so much for this first of many episodes together. Love you, my friend. I appreciate you being on the show. I appreciate being on my life. Love you. It was an honor. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. We'll talk soon.